Sabine uh, heads the Sustainable Resource Management and Global Change Working Group at the Mercator Research Institute. The title of Sabine's talk is Nature-Based, Engineered, and Hybrid Solutions for Carbon Removal. What is state of the art? Sabine? Thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen now. So thank you for this kind uh, invitation. I feel very, very honored that I um, that I'm invited to set a little bit the, the scene for uh, discussing these different technologies and approaches for removing CO2 from the atmosphere in this uh, second edition of the Stanford Carbon Management Workshop, of which I enjoyed the, the first part already very much. So I will also not touch too much base on the natural climate solutions as they have been covered in the first edition already and focus more on the engineered and hybrid solutions uh, for carbon removal. Try to give a little bit an idea of what is currently the state of the art without uh, being able, of course, to go into that much detail um, that uh, colleagues will, will be able to do uh, tomorrow when uh, there is a deep dive into, into some of these. Now, the nice thing to speak uh, after Chris, um, Rob, and uh, now also Jim is that I don't have to make big words anymore of why we actually need this. We've seen the 1.5 degree pathways from the IPCC special report, seeing this uh, immediate turnaround uh, of emissions uh, basically right now, massive uh, and uh, rapid emissions reductions already before 2030, implying um, basically a ratcheting up of the nationally determined contributions that nations have been putting on the table in the frame of Paris, reaching um, net neutrality in uh, around 2050. And then this is really the, the thing that I want to emphasize here. Um, none of the pathways that we were able to assess um, in the special report could actually manage to reach the ambitious Paris goals that, that is being well below uh, two degrees um, or even 1.5 degrees uh, at the end of the century without withdrawing at least some uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. So this is what I'm trying to illustrate here. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a scenario where explicitly um, there, there was a, an effort to uh, reduce the dependence on carbon dioxide removal and um, you see that still we dive under the zero line in the second half of the century. And also it means that we basically within a couple of years fall off uh, the cliff uh, pretty much and, and have to reduce uh, residual emissions super rapidly. Um, that's uh, against a scenario where um, we have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit um, slower emissions reductions in the, in the short to medium run, but that comes at the cost of making ourselves dependent on a lot more carbon dioxide uh, removal. Plus, uh, we will uh, then overshoot the temperature target, and that comes, of course, with higher uncertainties and higher risks associated uh, with those higher temperatures during that time. So um, I know many of you are already um, experts at this, but since I've been asked to set a little bit the scene, let's start with what happens actually under climate change. And that will also happen, uh, help us later on to understand the accounting uh, of different carbon capture and utilization pathways that were already a subject of the discussion now in this workshop. So what happens is we take fossil fuels out of geological formations, and then by using them, we um, emit CO2 to the atmosphere and thereby cause global warming. Now, if we substitute the fossil fuels with biomass, then yes, that biomass sequesters CO2 by means of photosynthesis, but if we transform it into energy, then we release it again to the atmosphere. So if everything works perfectly, the best we could actually achieve would be uh, a neutral outcome. The same can be said about combining uh, carbon capture and um, storage with uh, fossil fuels, uh, because then we only capture what we've previously been taking out of geological formations. Only if you um, don't let the previously sequestered CO2 from the biomass um, not escape back to the atmosphere, but instead capture it and store it underground, can we actually speak of a net negative balance. This is the technology that has been prevalent in many of the scenarios you've been seeing in, in the previous uh, slides, um, in, in the global pathways, also in the two degree pathways uh, that were uh, in the fifth assessment report already, the combination of bioenergy with CCS short backs. And of course, uh, these could be many different technologies. 
um, there could be bags associated with ethanol production, there could be bags associated with combusting biomass in a combined heat and power plant, and that also explains the wide range of potentials and costs that I'll be showing you in a minute. Um, before that, I want to touch base on a couple of things that have uh, surfaced in the talks already. Direct air carbon capture and storage, where you um, sequestered the, or, or you, you um, uh, take the um, CO2 directly out of the ambient air by means of a chemical reaction, and then also the process of enhancing natural weathering processes, where you grind uh, certain minerals very finely, distribute them over larger areas so that they can react with the CO2 and uh, permanently bind it. Uh, both of those processes need a lot of energy. So you see that uh, pretty much all of what I'm showing you has its uh, respective bottlenecks. The last thing is the one that I won't uh, say too much about. It's basically enhancing our natural sinks, the terrestrial sinks by planting, for instance, additional trees, restoring ecosystems, ocean sinks by fertilizing or enhancing uh, alkalinity. And uh, we'll be also hearing more um, from Preet Smith tomorrow on uh, changes in agricultural practices, for instance, to enhance uh, soil carbon. So you see that I'm uh, not uh, mentioning everything. There will also be uh, a talk on mineralization uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, I'll also be touching on uh, CCU later on. But let me first um, go to the uh, typology that I think will be useful for the discussion. So uh, we've seen uh, Chris covering the natural uh, component of, of carbon dioxide removal already. At the other side of the spectrum, you have the technological solutions, the engineered ones um, that I've covered here. Um, before uh, in this uh, illustration, I have actually not talked about uh, CO2 utilization. We've seen um, that it has quite some prominence also in the pathways that Jim has been showing us. And it's actually also part of the IPCC definition of carbon dioxide removal, because it, um, uh, it's, it's not only anymore about uh, storing CO2 underground or in oceans um, or in the biosphere, but it's also it also explicitly, um, since the special report includes storage in uh, long-lived uh, materials and products. So I think it's important to also shed a bit of light on, on, on post SR 1.5 uh, insights here. And then somehow awkwardly in the middle, we have this combined thing. Nobody really knows where to place backs uh, in the title of the workshop. It's called a hybrid uh, technology. And um, uh, this is actually also one of the reasons that many people are now proposing to actually uh, have a typology that's uh, based on uh, where the CO2 actually ends up. Is it in the lithosphere, in the hydrosphere, or in the biosphere? But I think this typology that's actually also used in the emissions gap report uh, by the UN will do just fine for our discussions here. Um, as I said, I will only make a couple of general points on nature-based solutions since it was in my title, because they are actually quite powerful when it comes to climate protection. And we've seen that also in the, in the intro uh, presentations. Um, and there was uh, recently uh, a comment out uh, by um, uh, Céline uh, Giradin and uh, colleagues that were really showing that nat nature-based solutions could actually um, reduce peak uh, temperatures uh, in, in 1.5 degree trajectories and also two uh, degree trajectories. And uh, there is a lot of literature out there that supports that uh, nature-based solutions, especially also um, what, what Chris was emphasizing, keeping our sinks intact are key for reaching the ambitious clim uh, climate targets set in Paris. In addition, um, they enable pathways with some sort of uh, cost containment. So we did some uh, research where we also took uh, nature-based options out. And then we saw that uh, this led to significantly higher carbon prices, which leads you to ask then, are these politically feasible anymore? Um, and will that then actually lead to ambitious targets uh, being abandoned? Um, so that, that's another advantage that nature-based solutions bring. Um, they're not facing as much public opposition as some of the technological approaches. I can say that because I come from Europe, especially in Germany, it's been very difficult to talk about geological uh, storage. So anything that has to do with CCS and also they can be managed such as to exploit multiple co-benefits. And I'm sure that Pete will also touch base on this in his presentation tomorrow. 
However, a word of caution also because I think in the debate, some things are always thrown into, into one pot and that's often not very useful when it, goes, when it comes to implementation. Nature-based solutions are actually much broader than natural climate solutions. They involve working with and enhancing nature so as to help address societal goals of which uh, climate protection is one, but as you see in the graphic on the right hand side, there are many more and and often actually nature based solutions have important benefits for society where carbon sequestration is more the co benefit. And if you manage then uh, nature based solutions by only looking through your carbon lens, you can actually uh, come up with quite suboptimal outcomes so a broader approach. Uh, where, where carbon removal might not be maximized, but many positive synergies can be realized might be more promising here. So after this word on, of caution on, on nature-based solutions, let me go back to, the, um, to our uh, usual suspects uh, from, uh, from the introduction I made. Um, here um, I show you uh, the costs and the potentials for carbon removal of the different categories I've been showing you before. Um, these are, uh, this is a systematic literature review for 2050 costs and potentials. You see wide ranges. This is partially of what I've been mentioning before, that uh, you actually have a, a, a wide, uh, the, these categories are, are a basket of, of individual technologies, but it's also different assumptions uh, that are standing behind uh, the estimates. And um, what you see, though, is uh, quite an impressive uh, potential that each of those uh, could be ramped up to. Um, with a word of caution, again, the caveat is that these are mostly bottom-up studies, so you cannot really add those up. So um, uh, they're competing for the same resources mainly. Uh, for instance, a piece of land that you have just afforested, uh, you, you cannot put a, a biomass plantation for backs, uh, just as a, as a brief example. Um, on cost, you also see wide ranges. Direct air carbon capture and storage will also in the middle of the century still be at the upper end of the spectrum um, with $300 uh, per ton of CO2 um, looking quite optimistic against some of the applications uh, and what they cost today. So um, this, is, this is not unrealistic. Bax is somewhere in the middle with enhanced weathering. And then we see um, the, uh, the, the options that are more on the natural side, uh, afforestation, soil carbon sequestration, biochar that are more on the um, low uh, costs um, side of, of this spectrum. However, you see that they have these dashed lines around them, these, uh, these asterisks, uh, afforestation and soil carbon sequestration, and that's supposed to, um, to show that they are actually more reversible than the others. Um, wildfires were already mentioned in the Q&A box. Uh, CO2 can quickly be released both for anthropogenic and for natural reasons as we see ongoing climate change exacerbating uh, some of these uh, effects uh, such as droughts and, 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 and other disturbances. So this is something that we have to reckon with in a long-term strategy that some of this could be reversed. And it's also of course a challenge for any governance and policy framework. So as you, you already feel, none of these really looks like a, um, like a silver bullet. Um, and uh, what I personally believe is that we will be seeing um, a portfolio of these different um, uh, options uh, that will be diversified, uh, not only across technologies, but also across geographies. And I think um, it is uh, very important to now uh, conduct studies to see what fits in with con context. And I will be coming back to this point in a minute. Before, I want to show you from the 1.5 degree report the full range. So what we did in, um, in the systematic literature review is that we also elicited expert judgment on um, what are the assumptions be behind the large ranges, which were much larger in, in the literature, and try to come up with something um, more realistic for, for the middle of the, of the century, also considering sustainability con constraints and so on. Um, but what you see here is actually the, the full range. Um, I don't want to go into detail with respect uh, to, to all of the technologies here, though, the, the, though um, uh, but I want to draw your attention to the right hand side of the of the um, of the graphic, which is on the side effects. And this basically shows uh, the state of knowledge 
um, of, of the side effects of the non-carbon effects that these uh, that the deploy the large scale deployment of these options would have. Um, and here, this is another um, another illustration of what I've been mentioning before that we won't see a silver bullet. All of those um, technologies I've been showing you um, will come to their limits, and um, with some of those, you also see uh, positive uh, side effects. For instance, enhanced weathering could have a positive impact uh, on crop yields if applied to agricultural areas. Same for biochar, some of the soil carbon um, techniques. Um, but for instance, if you look at BACs, most of the literature is really pessimistic. They look at these double digit uh, gigaton removals um, in, in, in the AR5 scenarios. And then um, uh, the concern is of course, with that much land that you would need to grow the biomass, you of course put um, biodiversity targets, food security, and, and much else um, in, in jeopardy. So um, that doesn't mean that there, that there can't, be, uh, can't be positive impacts of BACs as well, uh, but at least in the literature, these are not prevalent yet. Um, I think though that it is time to, to step a little bit away from those global pathways and, and, and having this um, sort of discussion around, uh, oh, they're showing us um, uh, 10, 20 gigaton CO2 removals uh, with BECs and that, that can't work. Um, but what we've also already seen in Jim's portfolio um, of, of, of technologies, it's now time to see what works in which uh, geographical context as well. So to illustrate that point, I've brought you the Swedish case, because in Sweden, they actually have a number of um, uh, large scale industrial applications, all conveniently located um, at, the, at the coastline. And uh, most of these are actually uh, biogenic the emission sources. So uh, retrofitting those with CCS um, achieves uh, negative emissions without actually um, needing uh, to dedicate any additional hectare of land uh, for further um, for further biomass cultivation. So this is a typical example of, of what I have in mind when I say that we need now to see what makes sense in, in which context. Definitely, uh, we won't get to 20 gigaton CO2 removals uh, through BECs um, in, a, in a very sustainable way globally. But in some cases, these things might um, make a difference. And it's, it's good to not exclude um, options ex ante when we look at what could work in which country. And this is the, um, uh, the marginal abatement cost curve that comes forth from the, from the Sweden case. The um, green bars are all the biogenic point sources, the gray ones, the fossil ones, and you see the green ones uh, make, a substan make up a substantial fraction um, of, the, um, of the total. And if you, if you add them all up, um, it's actually more than half of the total Swedish emission. So from all sectors that would be offset here. So um, just uh, one, one plea to, to actually um, go forth uh, with, uh, with the work um, uh, at, at national level as well. Now I promise to also say something on post SR 1.5 work and uh, one big debate that um, we're having uh, in Europe as well and, and uh, we're having here as well, as we saw it was a quite prominent um, a solution in, in, in Jim's pathways is CO2 utilization. And that's not a, not a wonder because um, it's actually a quite attractive narrative. We don't consider CO2 anymore as a, uh, as a waste product, but it's a resource, it's a raw material that we need and that we use. And it, it gives us a notion of a, of a circular economy. We could have a, potentially a big reduction of net costs of emission reductions, maybe even removals if CO2 gets stored in a product. Um, uh, we could potentially uh, have a big learning effect for other CCS technologies. And in the end, we would be using a cheaper and cleaner feedstock than the conventional hydrocarbons. So there's a, there's a lot of um, yeah, optimism in this, in this narrative. Um, and we conducted a, a systematic literature review after um, SR 1.5 with colleagues from Oxford, where we looked at a couple of those um, different uh, CO2 utilization pathways. And we actually did find that for 2050, there's quite some utilization potential. And what you see here is a, yeah, a speculative CO2 utilization curve, I, I uh, call it, where you actually see the uh, potentials plotted against the break-even costs. 
That means that in 2050, if you see negative break-even costs, these are processes that will be um, already uh, commercially attractive on their own. Uh, whereas those with positive break-even costs, they would still need some support um, to, be, to be economically viable. And we've looked at a lot of uh, different uh, things that would already make sense in the, in the middle of the century. I mean, polyol and urea, we already see that today, but also um, enhanced oil recovery um, is, is something that's, uh, that's, that's already um, being practiced. Um, others, uh, such as uh, processes in cement, uh, curing uh, fissure trapped fuels would still need support uh, in, in 2050. However, what I'm showing you here is a utilization curve. It's not a marginal abatement cost curve. And uh, that is very important when we discuss CO2 utilization as a removal um, option, because CO2 utilization could be doing a lot of things and, and where those uh, um, circles uh, of, of, of carbon dioxide removal, carbon uh, capture and utilization and carbon capture and storage intersect, um, these, these are actually very small uh, areas that could really lead to, lead to removal. In the end, CO2 utilization could even increase CO2 em emissions if you, for instance, use uh, a lot of non-decarbonized energy um, in, um, to, um, to, to, for instance, uh, make uh, synthetic fuels. Or you could have no net impact on CO2, but increase other greenhouse gas emissions, potentially um, uh, syn uh, synthetic fertilizers. Or you could reduce CO2 emissions, but not remove CO2 from the atmosphere on a net basis. So there were a couple of questions already in the chat about this. Where does the CO2 actually come from? Uh, what is the time frame when the, when the CO2 is released again from using the, the, the product? Um, and then, of course, you, you still have that smaller intersection, Bex related chains, for instance, where you would really have a removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. So in this whole debate around scaling up uh, CO2 utilization for a removal strategy, I think it's really important to keep in mind not to support CO2 utilization per se, but to really look at where what uh, emission gets uh, avoided or, or even uh, removed. And for that, I think three things are important. Where does the CO2 come from? Is it a biogenic source? Do we have it from the atmosphere? Or have we um, actually um, captured it from fossil sources? Uh, what is the system that we're working in? Is this decarbonized, the energy that we use to transform the CO2 in the pro uh, into the product? And then finally, what kind of product do we actually um, substitute for and what uh, do we uh, and, and do we release the CO2 upon utilization of the pro uh, product. So with that caveat, I want to go to to something else uh, that we haven't uh, talked much about, but that uh, Rob actually mentioned, and these are non CO2 greenhouse gases. I'm not going to say much about because uh, that because CO2 is the focus of this workshop. But global methane emissions have been on the rise, uh, more than 60% coming from anthropogenic sources. You've uh, seen what Rob was showing from the Global Carbon Project, uh, the methane budget. Um, and actually reducing methane from agriculture and, and, and also fossil fuel extraction to zero in a short time, that's very unlikely. In addition, we also have to grapple with earth system feedbacks. So a future scenario where you have an accelerated methane release from, from for instance, permafrost is, is very well possible. So it may, may, may very well be the case that we have to remove methane, but in a, in a, um, a paper that, that Rob has forthcoming uh, very soon, that's already accepted. Um, he shows that many knowledge gaps remain. I'm not going into the different methods for removing CO2. We can pick that up in the discussion. But um, what that paper clearly shows is that we need a research agenda, costs, technological efficiency, scaling, energy requirements, but also on the social barriers, co-benefits, byproducts, and more broadly on, on methane sorption to concentrate methane from low concentration background air, which is also uh, something uh, to be discussed in, 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 in the frame of direct air capture, of course. 
Now, finally, I want to make a point uh, about um, innovation. I've seen that, that there were a couple of questions in the Q&A box sort of pointing in that direction. How, who is going to pay for this? How, how, how can we actually do this, this quickly? And I know on day three, um, we'll dive more deeply into this and, and my, my, my colleague Greg Nemet will be talking about this. So I borrowed uh, uh, an illustration uh, here from him. Um, to, to sort of uh, set the ground uh, for this discussion as well, where um, there's a comparison between another uh, scaling example in, in the climate change mitigation debate, solar PV, uh, where you had the first commercial application in 1957. And then uh, only recently, we really talk about low cost. And then we're still a couple of years uh, away from being really in a position to talk about widespread adoption. Now, if we would translate that one-to-one -one as a sort of back of envelope calculation on direct air capture with the first commercial deployment of Climeworks in, in, in 2017, um, then we would be at low cost some time in the middle of the second half uh, of the century and that widespread adoption at the end of the century when we would have long needed to achieve uh, large scale deployment if we think back about the global pathways I was showing you in the beginning. So it seems that that, that the standard traditional innovation uh, models that we've been using do not work for, for, for the technologies that we're talking about here and that we need new models that can accelerate um, the development, bring us to low cost already in the first half of the century and to widespread adoption earlier in the second half of the century. Um, if we are already talking about the global pathways that I've been showing you in the beginning, um, then what also, what's also striking is, is the large innovation gap that we, that we see. Uh, we, we actually see these things being scaled up as of 2020, but in reality, we don't see a lot of this uh, on the ground yet. Um, we have an increasing um, knowledge base on CDR approaches. We know no, more about removal potentials, costs, side effects, systems integration even. But then when it comes to, um, to, uh, to, to innovation, uh, public perception and policy, there's really a big hole in the, in the knowledge. And um, this is what, what uh, also came out of the systematic um, literature review. We tagged them all the papers we found um, uh, for their uh, innovation stage. And there's a lot of research on, re uh, um, uh, on research and development, scale up, but very little on niche markets, demand pool, public acceptance, all, what, all the knowledge that we would need right now in order to, to set us on the right pathway and scale up. So with that, I wanna come to a close. There are a couple of, of takeaways I wanna leave for the discussion. Um, greenhouse gas removal, I turned during the, the, um, the presentation from carbon dioxide removal to greenhouse gas removal, as I mentioned, methane as well, is really a rapidly evolving field. It's an expanding set of technologies and practices that we're talking about here. Um, none of the approaches is really a silver bullet. We'll need a portfolio of options. We need a, actually a societal discourse on how much we want to remove and how we want to do that. And we'll need to close a huge innovation gap quite rapidly and expand also our knowledge for doing so. So with that, thank you very much uh, for your um, attention and I'm looking forward to uh, clarifications questions and even more so to the discussion later on. Great, thank you Sabine, that was excellent. Uh, we do have a couple questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is from Shafiq Jaffer um, and this question considers national versus global level. So how should we consider investment costs and the benefits to reach national net zero versus international? How should we think about um, dollars invested versus um, um, tons of carbon mitigated uh, to avoid the suboptimal use of limited capital? Yes, this opens the big box also of uh, emissions transfers and that, uh, that we could have uh, a cheaper potentials to be to be wrapped uh, elsewhere, and I think um, that is also something that's coming forth quite strongly from from the literature. If we look at scenarios that that limit um, the amount of um, of emissions transfers that are that are possible, it becomes more difficult. Uh, definitely, it becomes more costly. 
But the problem uh, then is um, that this is not the complete answer. But when we move to, to implementation, there are, of course, certain risks involved in, in, um, uh, in, in, in sort of reaping those, um, those cheaper mitigation potentials. And um, these have to, to do uh, with um, how these emissions transfers are, are really governed. How is it measured? Do we have the monitoring systems in order to really measure uh, whether a ton uh, was really removed? Are they permanent? Uh, who's liable for the permanence of these, um, these things? How can we prove that, that projects are, are generally removing it? How can we actually avoid some of the things that Jim was already alluding to, um, which uh, revolve around are these substituting more expensive decarbonization that has to happen anyway as well? Um, so are we talking about um, uh, actually causing some sort of um, uh, some sort of delay in emissions reductions that would otherwise happen. So in, in principle, yes, uh, there, there are um, uh, reasons uh, to, um, to say that capital could should be directed also at, um, at opportunities that we have uh, that we have uh, trans transboundarily. but um, uh, this has to be uh, happening with caution and with the right governance in place. Great, one more question. Can you talk a little bit more about the ancillary benefits of nature-based solutions and what different parts of the world are doing with respect to implementation? And this question is from Jennifer Mill. Yes, so the thing is that nature-based solutions are so broad and, and sometimes they're, they, they don't even have anything to do with, with, with the objective uh, to save the climate in, in, in the first place. So um, in, in, in that sense, there is already a lot uh, going on. Um, the problem with the ancillary benefits and how to sort of bring them together with a climate um, protection agenda is uh, that for many of them, it's also difficult to measure them. And um, you, you saw I had for the side effects, also the positive ones, these, these little icons in the IPCC report. And that was actually born out of the frustration that you had very little material quantifying some, some of these, um, these things. And um, that will make it, make it very difficult to, to get um, a payment systems going um, that, that, that sort of can, uh, can account for a broader, um, a broader uh, portfolio of, of values or, or ancillary benefits. Having said that, um, there is actually, I mean, more and more investors, uh, also institutional investors, uh, face uh, the challenge of, of speaking to more than just uh, than just carbon. Also, the Green Climate Fund, even though it's a climate fund, uh, has safeguards and, and, and criteria for non-carbon benefits. So I think uh, we are on the way to sort of integrate that. And I think um, uh, also if we if we have the carbon lens on, uh, we can uh, uh, work with governance and, and regulation so as to ensure that that uh, hotspot areas are protected and can um, and can that, that we actually avoid uh, risks. I mean, even if we can't measure things and put it all into into um, into monetary terms, um, it's of course possible to to identify um, areas that 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 warrant protection.